Okay. Okay, we're doing Holy Roman Emperors, the Ottonian Dynasty. Just so you know who we're talking about, we're going to do Ludwig the German, who was a Carolingian, the grandson of Charlemagne. Then we're going to do Hein uh, Heinrich the Fowler. Then we're going to do Otto the First, Otto the Second, Otto the Third, Heinrich the Second, Conrad the Second. Then several more Henrys, five, oh, sorry, three of them. Lothar, and then Frederick Barbarossa. And um, some of these characters aren't really uh, Ottonian. Um, uh, I'm going to go into more of these in detail later. But you sh I just want to give you sort of a primer on these ca this cast of characters because they're some of the more influential players in European history in the early Middle Ages. Um, by the way, happy uh, National Biographers Day. It's May 16th. It's the day that uh, Samuel Johnson met James Boswell. And the other thing is that um, it is my uh half birthday so without any so i'm 28 and a half and for me this is something i've been looking forward to for some time starting the series on german history lectures really it's medieval history um up until about the 30 years war and then i start to lose interest frankly i'm not i'm not i'm not a huge fan of prussia i think that's what kind of led to all the world wars um However, I will reevaluate that when this podcast gets further reinstated as a uh, history podcast rather than, you know, a, a variety show that's sort of been so far. Anyway, we can start with Ludwig the German. I don't have any notes. I don't have any numbers. I, I know that he was the son of Louis the Pious, and Louis the Pious was um, not a very shrewd um emperor he was the son of charlemagne and he was the third son his two older brothers had died before him so he was he had, was he was defaulted as the um, inheritor to the frankish empire the first of its kind cast with you know what is now france the low countries northern italy and, and germany um a little bit of denmark but uh that's about it um Anyway, Ludwig the German was, uh, uh, his name was Louis in French, um, or Louis in English. Ludwig has always just been the German word for Louis. Um, he, uh, his, his father, Louis the first, who was also called Louis the pious, um, could not find a sole heir for the Frankish empire. So he ended up having to divide it into three parts between his sons. Um, and when the West it was West Francia or West Frankish empire was Charles the bald, who was sort of known as the first King of France. Um, even though you could say Charlemagne was, but Charles the bald is considered the first King of France in the, in the sense that his role was to be, to run the area now known as Fr France and France alone, just about, um, I believe Lothar was, ran Lotharingia. I believe, uh, and then Lu Louis the uh, the German or Ludwig the German Ludwig had East Francia. Now, what's interesting about Ludwig the German is that he inherits East Francia, now now known as the bulk of Germany, and uh, of what is now Germany, I should say, and he does have a lot of pressure from the east to um, consolidate, or sorry, to um. To sort of they're sort of the, the 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 who are the what do they call them the Moravians who who are people from the Eastern uh, Czech uh, 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 they're they're not Bohemians they they're kind of what it's not Slovakia or the Eastern part of the Czech Republic those people were incursion and had incur were running incursions um, the that were chipping away at East Francia and Ludwig the German um, was kind of the uh, 
the bulwark for all of that. And he had uh, for all for the, for, for repul for repulsing them, and he had to consolidate uh, East Francia largely to you know forestall invasions, but also to to re refortify the various garrisons in the lesser nobility um, so that they could you know attack. Uh, uh, um, places like Hungary, which we see later on, because the Magyars would also start to invade. And, uh, the, and of course, you see, you know, there's a lot of paganism going around in the, the northeastern sort of quadrant of um, uh, East Francia. And that is going to be a, pre uh, it's going to be, it's going to mount an, as a problem for quite some time. And even after the high the high point of the Ottonian dynasty, it, it will still be a factor. Um, the Slavic so-called, you know, you, you can call them many things, but a shorthand is kind of the Slavic pagans. The Slavic pagans in what is now Pomerania or, or what was Pomerelia, it's a neighboring area, or Prussia in, in the Baltic, that area would always be sort of the bane of Germany's existence. And the formation of the Teutonic Knights was kind of like their rendition of a, a down-home crusade against paganism. Um, and that would, that, would, that would sort of reach, reach its fever pitch later on. But you can already see the sort of tension between Slavic paganism and German Christian um, in the example of the Moravians. Um, and they, uh, lowering the Germans is, is effective at sort of repulsing them um, and keeping, uh, you know, keeping the ship afloat. Uh, the Pope, um, he doesn't do any ex extensive conquering on his own. He's more of a, uh, an effective um, organizer than he, and a facilitator, but he's not really a, uh, a conqueror. Okay, um, and his successor, if I'm not mistaken, is Henry the Fowler. And Henry the Fowler was known for sort of hunting birds. He's like a bird hunter. And he, um, waterfowl, right? And he um, had a similar problem to Otto, uh, sorry, not Otto, um, uh, Lud Ludwig, which is that the East was always cutting in, always cutting in. And there was not a lot that he could do about it except kind of defend and make slight conquests, but very minute in, 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 the, in the grand scheme of the European geopolitics. Nothing like what the Romans would end up doing, right? You wouldn't really call him a conqueror, but he just sort of held the ship afloat. And and at this point, like, you know, even West Frankie is kind of doing the same thing. And Lotharingia, like all these all these old Frankish kingdoms, there's, they're, 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 well, they're new at this point, but the uh, they're, they're old enough in time that they kind of don't have to deal with a lot of the, 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 thr the threats of different, you know, you know, uh, high stakes warfare that you get in the late Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. And so Heinrich the Fowler is the first Ottonian, um, and he is considered Henry the first, and he's not the best emperor, but he's, he's, he's like a B plus emperor. Like he just kind of does everything he needs to do without being really, really exceptional. Um, and then that brings me to his successor, which was Otto the first. And Oddly enough, this guy is now, is now known as Otto the Great, kind of like how Charlemagne is known as Charles the Great. Um, and I, I would contend that Otto the Great, um, uh, despite being a descendant of Charlemagne, he is a, sort of a foundational figure in European history, and he really helps invent uh, Europeanism um, and as something that's delineated from the sort of the pagan free-for-alls. That they existed in the you know the Bronze Age and then the Stone Age, uh, and uh, I think uh, he he does sort of inherit the Roman Empire nominally. You know he's crowned by the Pope. He goes down to Rome. Um, Otto the Great is also um, he. There's a separate tradition in Germany than there is in France that is I think is starts to get acknowledged. With with a, with, a, with a, a figure as august as Otto the First. Now, unlike Henry the Fowler and um, Ludwig the German, and maybe you know Henry the Fowler was a little bit more like Otto than, in this way than he was uh, like Ludwig. But uh, Otto the First was a conqueror. 
Um, he wasn't an extreme oh, crazy conqueror. He was rather prudent as a conqueror, but and he remember he was doing this sort of reflexively because he was facing multiple uh, invasions from different frontiers. Um, he had the fight in Italy from uh, pesky sort of uh, rebels that um, were Christian. It was, he was fighting Christians, but he was he was sort of repressing um, unnecessary rebellions because the Italian city states back then were not were didn't really exist as powerhouses themselves, but they were sort of pe the petty nobility, the lesser nobility of the Lombard kingdom. And the Lombard kingdom was sort of, you know, ripping at the seam into various places. Um, and so if he was able to get the, the lesser nobility on his side, Otto could sort of gobble up the northern part of Italy. And effectively, he does that. And the Pope loves this. And um, basically... <sighs> surrenders this title of, you know, Roman Emperor to Otto first. Now, to be fair, there are reasons beyond just the, the, the success of Otto. Think of this as like the Mexican drug cartels or the mafia from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The Italian, the, the American La Cosa Nostra, right? They're not really doing the world a service. They don't necessarily have to exist. And the glory that there is imputed to them is sort of of, it's sort of a paper tiger fear tactic. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of fear mongering on the part of the Pope. Like they want the, the Greek, or for instance, the Byzantine Greeks, the successors to the Roman Empire in the East, who do have a cohesive sort of empire at this point. Um, I think it's under Basil, uh, the Bulgar Slayer, Basil the first or Basil the second. Can't remember in the 900s exactly. But they they're they're a menace in the east in the way because they're while while they are christian they recently not so long ago a couple hundred years they had an iconoclasm where they were sort of being seduced by islamic kind of principles so the greek orthodox um uh em, em, emperor was kind of a it was a religious threat to the west as much as he was a military threat to the east and the, it, the waters got muddied enough that the pope really was convinced that he need he it would help the the uh, Catholic Christendom to have you know a a, a, the, a namesake for uh, the Roman Emperor in Otto the first like having be the namesake of a Roman Emperor having the titular Roman Emperor but this is the thing is that Otto Otto the first um, did own did control land uh, somewhat in Italy. He can, and he can, he ended up controlling land in Bohemia. He ended up controlling land in Hungary, or you know, verging into Hungary because the Magyars were starting to invade, and they had to be repulsed as well. He also had he also had conflicts as far in the north by Denmark, so that were successful, or you know, reached some sort of stalemate with marginal gains for either party. The trade off, right? The the various the very successful on many frontiers for Otto were um, indicative of his sort of. Roman Roman Emperor personality, uh, but they didn't. It didn't signify to everyone in, in Europe at the time that he was the Roman Emperor. It, it wasn't like he was the un, unopposed Roman Emperor. He was squarely being. Um, in, he was squarely in competition with the Byzantine Emperor for that title. So, in effect, Europe was under a, st a stasis of diarchy where you had two kind of co-emperors rather than one single emperor, but they were religiously disunited and they were, they were kind of, they kind of hated each other. Um, uh, despite having enormous respect for each other, the, um, the great schism was, hadn't happened yet, but it wouldn't in, le in less than a hundred years or almost a hundred, a little over a hundred years, depending on what you're talking about in Otto's life, when you're talking about, phases in Otto the Great's life. And in 1054, the, the the Eastern Orthodox Christians and the Western Catholic Christians would decide that they were irreconcilably different, have a sort of ecumenical divorce, as it were. So this was going to set the stage for really the downfall of the Byzantine Empire, because now they were no longer seen as, you know, companions with the Western Christians and the Western Christians are kind of free to like, you know, experiment amongst themselves with new roots of trade um, and new, new sort of theology. Uh, I mean, new roots of trade, I say that, but that's, you know, you have to wait a few hundred years for that to really kick off. But right in the high middle ages, which is about the point we're, we're leaning into, they were really start to tinker around with 
new theological ideas that hadn't really been under, un, undertaken by the, the Greek Orthodox guys in the East who were still um, sort of mystical in the way that they approached theology and they weren't as clear cut and they're Aristotelian as, as you know, the West would sort of seem to be under people like um, Abelard or Thomas Aquinas or Bernard of Claveau of Clairvaux or uh, a lot of these luminary monks, right? Um, you know, the one I think about is uh, Dun Scotus, you know, Bonaventure, right? I mean, maybe, none of these guys, maybe Bonaventure was earlier. I can't, I can't remember on Bonaventure, honestly. I can't remember everything. But Otto the first sort of rep reflected a departure from um, a sort of like a, like a Dark Ages Western Europe that was constantly fraught with vying um, Germanic tribes that had neither of which had really any pedigree of the Roman Empire. Right. Otto the first kind of reflected like a, a return to form, but his return to form was a um, was a bit of a pump fake because he he just he needed a station to to promote the Western Europe so that it would look comparable to um, you know Eastern Europe of the time, uh, the Byzantines. Right. He needed it to sort of he needed to sort of vie with the Byzantines for supremacy, but he couldn't really, um, he couldn't really just defeat them. And it would, he, because they were also mutually Christian, it was seen as wrong to even try. And his so-called allies in the West wouldn't have supported it necessarily. They're, they're the, 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 the lines for invading the Eastern Orthodox empire as, a, as, as the healthiest possible neighbor that the Western Christianity ever had. It was almost like, he, he, the, 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 I guess what I'm trying to say is that the real politic brutality of the Roman emperor, empire and the Principe and all this with like, you know, Caesar and Augustus and Trajan and uh, Hadrian, all, all of that doesn't exist anymore because the political landscape is a lot more socially conscious uh, a thousand years or so later, right? So, the Christian world is actually a lot more socially conscious than it would have been in the Roman pagan world. And the, the idea that you would invade another Christian um, really didn't really was, um, was sort of like uh, it, 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 how do I explain? You couldn't do it on cultural reasons alone. You had to do, it had to be done because there was a, a strong legal claim that your house owned land that someone else was possessing and using, right? It would became, it was sort of an aristocratic um, war based warfare rather than a culturally based warfare. The Romans are, they didn't, they didn't respect other cultures and cultures that were similar to them. They didn't respect that. They, they would still conquer them even if they respected them. But the Christians, they don't conquer other nations because they neither respect nor disrespect them. There's something odd about the, the sort of Christian thread that kind of pacifies neighbors. It makes people more neighborly and less contested. And so in the Middle Ages, you're seeing this with West and East. You're seeing that the, the Latins and the Byzantine Greeks, they don't really want to fight each other despite obviously having some sort of advantage in doing that. Um, politically. And I think that one of the reasons is that obviously it, it, um, the Roman Empire fell apart, fell apart largely because there's a difference between Greek, Greek um, orthodoxy and uh, the Western, um, well, not orthodoxy as such, but the Greek style of Christianity and the Greek linguistic culture, and then the Western sort of Roman Latin based culture. There was sort of differences already even in ancient times. And the Roman Empire fell apart because those differences did sort of a they, they did they didn't abet the Roman Empire. They sort of dragged it through the mud and made it heavier, more of a burden on itself. So, yeah, I think the um, the uh, Otto the First is is the emperor of the West, and for all, all intents and purposes, you know, Basil is the emperor of the East. Or maybe at this time it was, no, Irene was earlier, I think. Yeah. Anyway, Basil is the emperor of the East. 
And this is also true of Charlemagne. Charlemagne tried to marry uh, into the East and it didn't work out. So when even when Charlemagne had all this power, more than the Otto does, um, Charlemagne failed to reunify the Roman Empire because the East, East, Eastern Greeks would not share power. Um, and this sort of, so the East, Eastern Byzantine Empire is sort of this intriguing buffer state that really kind of limits the effective ability of the, uh, the Western Roman Empire. Now, this is the thing, is that the Western Roman Empire may not exist anymore. Um, but Otto I was smart in that he understood that he could, that he could invade upward and eastward and then call that land part of the Roman Empire, the new Roman Empire under him. And that would reinvigorate the, the, the Roman Empire as something un, a, sort of like a Frankenstein monster of, of version where it was Germanic and it's sort of tacky. It was sort of this tacked on Roman empire that because he was loyal to the Pope, technically he was, it was Roman, right? That was, that was the, that was the, the outlook. Charlemagne did the same thing, but with Charlemagne, he had the, he was, he pretended to be more Latinic than Otto ever did. Um, Charlemagne, you know, controlled France and Italy was Latin, Gallo, Roman languages, right? Italic, right? But uh, Otto only ever controlled Northern Italy. So he couldn't really claim to be as broadly um, the inheritor of the Roman Empire, but he still did. And that's, the, and that's the trippy part. And so at this point, a lot of people, a lot of historians will view Otto as a guy that failed to really understand the, the depths of the Roman, of what it meant to be the Roman Empire. I think Otto didn't fail to understand this at all. I just think he, he had this, he had a little too much ambition and he thought he could kind of just insist that the Roman Empire was this sort of north to south slither from Italy up through up to Denmark, which just is laughable to modern people, I suppose. But I think in a, in a re very real sense, it helped shape European politics to the point where it ended up being true in its own spirit in a kind of demented way for over a thousand years. So yeah, I don't, I think that the, the power politics of the time were conducive to that north to south quadrant, sorry, corridor, the north to south longitudinal corridor being a new power base for Europe and a buffer between west and east, effectively what we now know as central Europe, but it became a central European empire, nominally the, the new Roman empire. Um, Otto the second, Otto the second and Otto the third, um, really tried to uh, sort of work hand in glove with the Pope and invade and fight westward more so to get lands back to try to reunite the, the Charlemagne's empire. They, that failed. They, um, it didn't work out at all. Um, in the East, they lost a lot of lands in France, uh, sorry, in Northern Italy too. Um, they're not called Otto the Great, right? They're Otto the Second, Otto the Third. They weren't nearly as capable, but they did sort of slow the decline a little because they they were able to sort of see the inevitable decline of Otto, their Otto's um, empire, and then they sort of staved off it from declining rapidly. But it still it still declined uh, in, a, in an official sense. Henry the Second, Conrad the Second, Henry, these guys all um found new ways to conquer in central europe and then they also lost land and eventually it was sort of like it was just gambling they were just gambling away land and sometimes winning and sometimes and losing and they kind of just prolonged this imperial time um for hundreds of years until you get to frederick the first and frederick the first at the time of frederick the first it's about 400 years since charlemagne died um, so, um, despite these guys being very interstitial and, um, not, uh, um, luminaries for their times, Lothar the third and the Henry's and Conrad the second were all, um, and, and then the second two autos, they were all very much, uh, um, 
effective rulers for, for what they had to do, which is to keep the empire stable. Unfortunately, nothing can be stable without having to grow somewhat. Um, you know, I mean, there's entropy in all things, right? And so as much as they tried to stabilize, they kind of, they kind of just buried their heads in the sand in many cases, or they were sort of bipolar and sought, sought gains where they couldn't, or where the, the gain would be impossible to find. And um, only until it really took Frederick the first to really kind of invigorate the, the Holy Roman empire as this kind of Frankenstein monstrosity version of the Roman empire of yore. Um, so he's going to, he's going to be where I stop. I think um, I'm going to break down the contributions of these lesser figures in my, in my coming videos in this series. And we're going to have kind of fully formed lectures on each of them out of the first, out of the second, out of the third, of course, Henrik, Heinrich the second, Conrad the second, um, are particularly interesting as well. Henry, he, once you start getting in he, my least favorite are, these latter Heinrichs, because we know that, um, you know, they, they were starting to lose favor with the Pope and famously Heinrich the fourth had to beg and beg and beg the Pope to let him, um, be the emperor. And he, he had, he waited for weeks outside his, 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 uh, palace to visit with him. And then eventually the Pope said, okay. And this was during the investiture, comp, uh, uh, controversy where now the now we're seeing the rise of the papal states as a formidable power, as something as as a, as a globally influential, world changing power, right? Like, um, and per, I mean, globally influential and potentially world changing. I, sh I just I should stipulate the papal states are now seeing themselves as, hey, we're Rome. Why do we have the Germans calling themselves, you know, the, the Roman emperors and sort of running things all over the place? when they don't even live down here and we live down here and we're the, and you know, we're true Christians because we define what Christianity really is. So the popes are getting very arrogant because they have all the military support they need from the Germans, but then they don't really um, have a lot of uh, temp uh, material power, secular worldly power, right? So what they do is they do something a little bit brazen which is they this is actually very brazen which is they decide that now the, the the emperor can't really determine who the bishops are in in the in, in the emperor in the empire and, and frank and frankly no one can um but the emperor has a problem with this and he resists and he refuses adamantly until the pope withholds um all sorts of things and so we'll get into this and eventually the pope wins and says that free investiture is no longer allowed and the pope and you know, uh, subordinate archbishops, cardinals, they can determine who uh, runs uh, the entire ecclesiastical Christ uh, realm of Christendom. So, who runs the monasteries? Who is the C Who runs the bishoprics? These are going to be determined by the Pope and his subordinates, and no one who is a non-ecclesiastical authority. No kings, no barons, no marquises, right? No earls, right? None of that. You know, the counts, are, you know, they're just military men, effectively. You know, they don't really have, you know, the, the propagandistic value that, that the, the bishops and archbishops are going to have. And so the Pope starts to sort of form as a counterweight to the Holy Roman Emperor. And we're starting to see a, a, a system that's um, the Caesaropapism that's very, very different from what's in the Greek Orthodox world where the Greek Orthodox emperor um basically it makes the patriarch of the his bitch um whereas in in the western roman you know holy roman empire the germanic empire uh the pope isn't really the bitch of the emperor in fact the pope sort of determines who the emperor is and he can kind of undermine him in various slights and slights of hand and uh the pope starts to be seen as a preeminent power all his own um and the the papalism of, of the coming centuries is going to really um, introduce strong, strong changes to uh, the political structure of, of Western Europe to the point that it becomes kind of unrecognizable from other parts of the world um, because of how unique the overall religious and secular structure is. The Christendom, the way Christendom 
um, sort of threads itself together. It becomes very unique compared to other parts of the world that do not have a religious authority that is domineering as the popes. And Rome is kind of proving that it is no longer um, a sideshow to whatever Paris or, you know, Magdeburg or, um, you know, uh, Al-Andalus or Baghdad, right, or Constantinople. Rome is actually, is always, it's still as powerful as we dreamed it was, you know, like it's still as powerful as it had ever been. And that's going to become more prevalent a theme as time goes on. And it's always going to, it's going to be more and more in doubt, but it will never be completely removed from the sort of the consideration of, of power brokers in Europe in the early modern period. And of course, all the way back uh, to this time in the middle ages. Uh, it, it, it really only starts to devolve once Protestantism um, picks up. And Protestantism, in a way, can be seen as a revenge of this Germanic clan of you would-be Holy Roman Emperors or would-be Roman Emperors, right? So a guy like Henry IV um, is, is already representing the tension between the Germanic people and the Italian people. He doesn't really agree with the Pope. He has conflict with the Pope at the highest possible level of stage in political theater. You're going to see this play out again and again, but you're going to see it play. It's not going to really take on the magnitude and gravity that it has now. Then we're going to reach that again until you get to, um, uh, uh, I mean, arguably it happens somewhat down the line, but the big, the big mainstream example is Martin Luther. Martin Luther is going to be the real, um, turning point where you start to see that the Protestants actually had a lot more power over the Pope than even, you know, a guy like Otto the first might've had. So the, the power shifts and the tables turn. And unfortunately we're not going to touch upon all of those different centuries, um, in this sort of region. Although eventually we will, I hope I eventually, I, I hope that we can do it. Um, in, in an effective way. But for now, in this series, um, and if everything goes smoothly, happy biography day, by the way, May 16th, and my half birthday. If everything, and the day that Boswell met Johnson, but let's not forget, if everything goes smoothly, we're going to have fully formed lectures on Ludwig the German, Heinrich the Fowler, Otto the First, Otto the Second, Otto the Third, Heinrich the Second. Conrad II, Heinrich III, Heinrich IV, Heinrich V, Lothar III, Frederick I, and then every subsequent Holy Roman Emperor. Because I want you to really get a full complement of intelligence on all these, all, all, all the all the turns and bends in the this this fascinating polity from the Middle Ages, this this spiritual continuation of the Roman Empire. Was it the Roman Empire? Was it not? It's the ultimate question. And the penultimate question is, does it, if, if it wasn't, or even if it was, was it a powerful empire? Was it, was it, was it a world shaking empire or was it something sort of insignificant and um, secondary in the grand scheme of European history and world history, if you think about it? Okay. Well, I can't wait to do these. Obviously, some of these emperors I'm biased more towards than others, but we'll find that they all have their influences. I'm sorry, their influential moments, and they all have their sort of deciding moments. They all have their strengths, their weaknesses, and their sort of claims to fame, um, despite the, the obscurity of many of them to uh, an American audience. Okay. So without any further ado, I'll cancel... Uh, we, we've done about 35 minutes. I think that's good for an introduction, a primer on uh, the Western Roman Empire successor state, the Holy Roman Empire, which, by the way, was called the um, Romanum Imperator. You know, it meant um, the emperor of all the Romans, of the Romans, right? That was the term that was used. The term Holy Roman Empire I don't think was used till much later, if it was used at all. And it, it's basically um, a mock-up, a send-up of the very concept, if not 
And if it does exist, it is um, used kind of in a, as an anachronism because they didn't start to use that term until way later. So it's not really the whole Holy Roman Empire in their own language. They use the Roman, they use the Latin term for emperor of the Romans, which I admit sounds uh, underhanded and sort of quite, uh, nebulous, but bear with me that the Greek, the, the Byzantine Greeks were doing the same thing. And of course they weren't called Byzantine, you know, they were, they were never called Byzantium. They were called, they were calling themselves the same thing. They were calling themselves the Roman, um, not the Hoyer, they're calling themselves the, uh, Romanorum. I mean, they, I don't know if they're using Latin for it, but they were using Basileus titles, which means King in Greek. Uh, they were using their own Greek language to say the same words, which were Roman emperor, em em empire of the Romans. This is Rome. They were always saying that in Greek, but keep in mind that the, the, the Eastern uh, Greek uh, Christians were really, um, they weren't doing anything new by using Greek or Latin. They had been using Greek in, um, in, even in the Principate of the Roman Empire, you know, in the, in the time of Marcus Aurelius, right? They were using Greek as an administrative language in many cases, and they're using it Greek on their coins even in many cases. So for them to use Greek and still insist to be that, that they were, you know, leading the Roman Empire despite not having any land claim to Rome or land control in Rome, despite not having that, they could, they still were keeping the, a lot of the same traditions alive and even their own military and um, uh, technology and agriculture. And um, a lot of that stuff was still kind of in, in keeping with the Roman Empire emperor. And it wasn't really as dissolved as you might think from the past. But uh, this is not a lecture series on the, uh, you know, the Eastern Roman Empire. It's a lecture series on this fascinating idea that the Western Roman Empire continued into the Holy Roman Empire. And we just live in this sort of biased time against the Holy Roman Empire. And we, in fact, we are calling it the Holy Roman Empire when it wasn't really called that until much, much later after it sort of reached a period of decline. So I'm hoping I can sort of pave the way for a reevaluation of um, Central European history and the way that we look at the power base and powerhouse of uh, Central Europe, not just in the Middle Ages or in the early modern period, but also in antiquity. Because I think you'll notice if you look at it, even in Roman times, the German area was very threatening and it was never fully conquered or even um, halfway conquered by the Romans. But I guess that is lends to the irony of, of them ever claiming to be part of the Roman Empire, doesn't it? So without any further ado, at 38 minutes and 20 seconds, I will st stop this and upload it right about now. Happy Biographer's Day. Cheers.